the scripture that Julius just read was actually written by somebody very, very close to Jesus. He was, uh, um, he was actually the brother of Jesus. Uh, so they, they, they grew up together. Um, you know, we often talk about Jesus and we, we talk about the, the disciples that went around, but they met him at different times. Um, some of them left the boats. You know, uh, Peter was a, you know, was a fisherman, as we know, but James is writing this. And he, he grew up with Jesus, and, uh, but recognized him as the Son of God. Recognized uh, him as someone who wasn't just a brother. And he's writing here uh, some very strong things about the tongue. And Jesus in the Bible is actually described as, as the Word, the living Word of God. Uh, we also have in, in, in the beginning of John, when John describes Jesus, he says, in the beginning was the Word. And that's, that was Jesus. And when God created the whole universe, he spoke. And the Bible's recorded, it says, let there be light. We've heard this a lot, haven't we, over the years. Let there be light. You know, we often have that little moment, you know, when uh, somebody puts the light on in the living room and, and it's getting a bit dark and somebody just suddenly says, yep, let there be light. You know, these things have a, a profound source. God's word brought this world into, into being. His word is, is powerful. It's creative because he's the creator. But it also gives us an idea of how powerful words can be for us, even though we're not, we're not God. But we have the power, with our words, to produce good and produce evil. And God's word, when he speaks, and the, his written word in terms of the Bible, when God speaks, is an extension of who he is. But the difference between him and us is that he's entirely consistent. What God says matches exactly who he is. His words are entirely consistent with who he is. And if you contrast that with our inconsistencies, and Julie read the passage in James where it talks about out of the same mouth, that we praise God and we, we praise our Lord and Father, says James, with the same tongue. At the same time, he says, as we're doing that, we're quite happy, it seems, to just curse our brothers and sisters, or they might not be brothers and sisters, but other people. And he says, the two don't go together. There isn't a consistency there with us as human beings in the way that when God says something, it's entirely consistent with who he is. You know, sometimes uh, we, we say to each other, we say to ourselves, you know, when something's happened and we've said something and you reflect on it later and you know what? Somebody says to you, you know, Chris, you know when you said so-and-so? I said, yeah. And he says, that, that's not really you. And sometimes you reflect on it and you say, yeah, you know what? That, that wasn't me. And what we mean by that, surely, is we're saying, look, that's not who I aspire to be. That's not my identity. It's not the identity I want to answer to. And it is about identity. Who are we going to identify with in our words? Over here we have, the Bible says our enemy, the great enemy, Satan, the devil, is described as the father of lies. And we hear that expression, don't we? We say, look, are you going to do the devil's work? And it's an expression that basically says, are you going to help you know, are you going to add lies or are you going to be used to speak lies because Satan is the father of lies? And then over here we have the truth. And the Bible says that it's the, only the truth that lasts. The lies don't last. They're often uh, exposed very quickly. And you can't build anything on lies. The Lord is the truth. And... Our identity is certainly as believers, as adopted sons and daughters of, of Father God, 
is that we speak God's words and we don't speak the enemy's words. And we're speaking life and we're not speaking death. Now you might say, well, Chris, I don't think I've spoken death before. I may have said a few things, but we've got to be careful. Sometimes we shift, we're quite happy to shift our goalposts so that it accommodates us. We think, no, I'm quite happy in this thing. A white lie didn't hurt anybody. Um, that word I said, it wasn't really discouraging. Well, I didn't think it was. But the other person thought it was very discouraging. And as far as the Bible's concerned, you know, when we discourage somebody um, unduly, it's not because you're bringing a word of correction to help them. You, you've just discouraged them with, with something that was unnecessary. And the Bible says that's bringing death. Now, it's not terminal because God is gracious. The Bible says that love covers over a multitude of sins. But nevertheless, in that moment, we're not speaking life. Whether we realise it or not, we're speaking death. And can I just say, as I stand before you this morning, um, I was talking to my mum yesterday uh, about the subject and uh, I said mum this is what I'm preaching on tomorrow my mum's 81 and we're chatting about something and she says to me but Chris you know e she said to me but even you she said I said and I started laughing I said mum of course <laughs> of course <laughs> we're all under the gospel none of us none of us can stand before the Lord and we'll come on to this in a minute none of us are immune from this but that's why we need the Lord but um but let's move on. It starts off by saying, not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So James is speaking about himself. He's saying we. We, uh, we, will be, we who teach will be judged more strictly. And you know, I, just so you know, I often agonise about what I present here or what I speak to people about that know I'm a believer because... If, you, if, you're, if you're presenting or representing God's word, you need to make sure it's accurate. You need to make sure it's faithful to the spirit of the word as well. And I, for one, I'm very soberly conscious of that. Because we have the opportunity, certainly those who teach, to influence with our words. And our words need to be God's words, if that's what we're doing, if we're teaching. And they shouldn't be coming out of a human heart. Because the Lord says he will judge us more strictly than everybody else. So he's not saying don't do it. He's not saying don't aspire to it. If God's called you to it, do it. Follow it. But bear in mind the responsibility that comes with it. But this is just a sign of the weight of words which I'm sure, as we continue this morning, may, the Lord may bring to your mind words spoken over you, or words that you've said that just, well, it was the wrong thing. Some things that you may have recovered from, maybe things that you haven't yet recovered from, maybe things that you're aware of, but you're still just managing them, you're not completely, completely free of it. And maybe you regret something terrible that you said, or you, th you thought it was terrible, I'm not here to judge this morning. I'm just saying we, we are aware as we continue here, we're not just talking about teachers of God's word. And then James says, we all stumble, he says, in many ways. And when he says stumble, it's not that flippant way that we say sometimes, look, we all make mistakes. As if that lets us off the hook. As if we're all making mistakes, so you can make some more mistakes, I can make more mistakes, we can just carry on. Making. No, no, James here is talking about sin. He says we all stumble in many ways, we all sin. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And then he says, anyone who's never at fault in what they say, never at fault in anything they say, is perfect. Able to keep the whole body in check. In other words, if you, if you or I can control this in terms of what we say, it has such a massive impact on the rest of our lives. Because we speak things over ourselves as well as over other people. Our words are incredibly powerful. 
And so what he's saying is, if you hear somebody, they never say anything wrong. Not even their tone. It, that person is perfect. And of course, we're not perfect yet. The Lord is perfecting us. And it causes us to rely on the Holy Spirit for what we can't do ourselves. You know, um, it was King David who, who said, he said this, King David wrote many of the Psalms as we know, but this is in Psalm 141 verse 3. And this is recorded, of course, so people can refer back to these, to these verses and what, what, what I shared this morning. But King David is, is aware of the power of words and what he might say. He talks about what other people have said to him, about being slandered, about being unfairly treated, about being accused of things he hadn't done, accused of being what he wasn't. But he also speaks about himself and he says this, he says, Lord, he says, set a guard, set a guard, where? Over my mouth. Set a guard over my mouth. Lord, he says, keep watch over the door of what? Of my lips. So set a guard over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. He knows. He knows that and we should know. So the reason I refer to that is because we're here this morning listening to God's word, thinking, well, look, you know, I know I'm not perfect and my words are not perfect, etc. But we can't sit there. We can't just turn around and say, well, we'll make mistakes and they should just get over it. We the Lord doesn't let us do that. And there's a bit that this chapter, this passage that Julie read this morning is a good chunk of scripture dedicated to this. And it's not the only one. But it's the one we're focusing on this morning. To our words. But we need God's help to not do the wrong things and not use our tongue in the, in the wrong way. You know, um, in Proverbs it says the tongue has the power of life and death. In other words, there's, there's nothing wrong with the tongue in that sense. I mean, we're talking about, it talks about restless evil and all these things, but it's talking about the wrong use of the tongue here. But in Proverbs it says the, the tongue has the power of life, but it's also got the power of death. And it refers to these bits in the, in the mouths of horses. Uh, I've only been on a horse you know, once or twice and I, I didn't do it very well. I think it broke into a trot and I didn't have to sit on it properly and it hurt. It was really uncomfortable. And uh, I've, I've not been one of these people that was around horses. It always seemed to be a rather sort of quite a posh thing to do, to go horse riding, if you know what I mean. So we never really had that. But I think on a school trip or so, we did that. And one horse just did his own thing. I'm glad he came back to the stables afterwards. I didn't know what was going on. I was just holding on for dear life. But, you know, if I knew what I was doing, I, I did have reins. I, I, but I just didn't have to, But the idea of these reins is that there's a bit... It's a small bit. If you look at the weight of a horse, and it controls the horse. And the Bible says you can turn the whole animal around. And you see them on the dressage, you know, in the Olympics, etc. Think, how do they do that? How do they get a horse to just stand on the spot and do this, two steps here? James is saying, look, it might be a small thing, but it controls the whole animal. You can control the whole animal with the bit. And he's saying the tongue, it's a small part of us. But that's how powerful it is. It can turn the whole, the whole body, if you like. It can change your life's direction. It's got life and death in it. And then it gives the example of ships as an example. Now, you know, however big the ship is, there's almost always a rudder. And the rudder is a, a very small part of a huge ship. I mean, they weigh many thousands of tons, some of these big ships. And it says here, James says here, although they're so large, he says, these are his words, and they're driven, he says, by strong winds. And we know what it's like on a windy day. And if we can imagine a ship, certainly in James's day, with sails up, whew, I mean, to, to hold it in place and to steer it takes some doing. And obviously part of that is using the sails, but the rudder is key to directing this great big ship if it's going to go that way or this way, this small thing, 
of a ship by weight directs the ship. And there James is saying, the tongue is like that. It might be small, but it directs traffic in our lives. It directs traffic in our lives. So we need to make sure we know how it's directing traffic and, and, and what it's doing for us and where our source is. We'll come on in a minute to the source of what we speak. And then he says this, and this is probably the biggest visual that I've, I've had in my life for many, many years. He says, consider what a great forest, a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. And uh, I, I've, I've been looking at words in scripture about speech for, for many years. I, I can remember being on an aeroplane, going on holiday, and uh, I just spent most of the five hours just going through words in scripture starting with Proverbs, where the, where the, where the Bible speaks about speech. But this is in James in the New Testament. And no doubt he's seen examples where a spark in conversation led to a whole forest being set alight. And that's the analogy he uses. And suddenly you find yourself in this situation and you think, whoa, hang on a minute. What, what happened here? There's flames everywhere. It, it, the heat's incredible. Where's this inferno come from? And it can be traced back and back to something very, very small. It was just a spark. And it had an enormous impact. You know, um, I think this was in this country, uh, they discovered that one of the fires that started, one of the wildfires in the dry heat, was um, a couple of campers that had finished with the, the like, portable barbecue. They thought it was out. I mean, there was no flames visible. But no doubt there was embers, and they just, they just threw it into the woods. They finished with it, rather than disposing of it. And that set off a fire that destroyed many, many acres. But in America, where there's bigger forests, as we know in previous years, it was almost impossible to contain them. It just melted everything, destroyed everything. Thousands of trees laid waste, animals destroyed their habitats. Crops that were actually ready for harvesting in this country destroyed from a spark. And... It doesn't take much. With the two campers, it was, it was carelessness that led it. They didn't deliberately start a fire. They didn't deliberately want thousands of acres to, to burn. Or people to lose their homes in America. Now, we know for some people it is deliberate. They do want to start a fire. And even in life, with the tongue, people speak and they're deliberate. They want to start a fire. And you have to decide, I have to decide, are we going to put wood on the fire? Are we, we going to let it burn? Are we, we can see the spark, we can see the potential. Are we going to let that fire take hold or not? We have to make decisions every day of our lives. And the scripture says that um, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So it's another analogy now. It's not fire. It's like breaching a dam. You know the, the big walls that, that hold back the water in a dam? And this, Can you imagine that breaking and the volume of water that comes through? Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter. Drop the matter before a, dis a dispute breaks out. Huge consequences to our words. But although some people deliberately, they know what they're doing, and you'll meet them, want to start a fire. You can't have a fire without fuel or wood. And again, in scripture it says this, Without wood, this is in Proverbs 26, verse 20. Without wood, a fire goes out. 
without gossip, a quarrel dies down. It's up to us whether we're going to add wood or we're going to say, look, I'm going to starve this potential fire of its fuel. It's not going to have my wood to grow. If anything happens from here, I will have no part in it. It won't be my wood that's causing this fire. I don't know where it's going to end, but I will have no part in it. And it says here that uh, about a quarrelsome person, this is in Proverbs 26, verse 21. It says, as charcoal is to embers, so embers, that barbecue that they threw away, the little embers that were burning, The relationship between charcoal and those embers, as wood is to fire. In other words, that's the comparison. That's what a quarrelsome person, it says in Proverbs 20, God's word. That's what a quarrelsome person is for kindling strife. Now, we know what kindling is, don't we? It's the small bits of wood before you get to the big fire. So there's a stepping stone. And it says here that a stepping stone to fires like this will be someone who's quarrelsome because they kindle strife. They put the small bits of wood on a fire that then has the potential to really reap havoc later. So then James goes on, he says, the tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. Now this is the wrong use of the tongue. Its potential to cause harm is so much more than our other parts of the body. It's got so much more potential to do something than uh, your arm, my leg, you know, my head, you know, your nose. It, the tongue is completely disproportionate to the rest of our bodies in terms of the harm and the potential for harm it can do, but also the wonderful good it can do. It's got the power over life and death, as we said. But small sparks can be set, can cause a fire because we're just not aware sometimes. We're, we're just a bit careless. We said a careless word. Um, or somebody said a careless word to us. And afterwards we think, you know what, I'm sure they didn't mean it. And the Bible does talk about overlooking offences. It, it, that's true. We're not going to pick up on everything. Otherwise we'd, we'd be at war with everybody all the time. But nevertheless, it, it's the carelessness of a word or words that sometimes can stick. And somebody, uh, it was actually a famous personality, we were watching MasterChef the other day, and they're on the competition, a celebrity. And she was saying, you know, famous, wealthy. Um, and I think one of the judges said, you really don't believe in yourself, do you? That you're good at this. And she said, no, I, I, the truth is I don't. And he said, after all the success you've had, all, the, all you've achieved, you know, Grammys and, you know, and she's no, I, she's, it's, and then I, I just said, I turned around to Julie when she said this, she said, no, it's just, you know, people say things, don't they, as you're growing up, and I think I'm still probably dealing with some of that. And my heart sank a little bit. But she's not unique. She's not unusual. We've all experienced that to some degree. James goes on to say, he says, it corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of your life on fire, if you let it. And he says, and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, I think we need to say something here about what, what this might mean. You know, if our words have got sources... And I mentioned earlier, there's a source, there's the father of lies, we've got the enemy, we have Satan. The Bible says he's the enemy of the brethren. He's the enemy of people generally, God's people generally, uh, specifically. But he comes, the Bible says, to kill, steal and destroy. It's damage that he's after. And then we have the word of truth. And when we submit ourselves under the influence and we connect to the wrong source. And even as believers, we can do that. And hear me here, I'm not talking about suddenly we will be possessed because as believers, we've created, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we can be influenced by evil. 
even as believers. We need to recognize it. And sometimes when you're thinking something and you're about to speak it, you think, hang on. Where, where's the source of that? If I speak this, where's the source coming from? And if you're a believer, you'll have the Holy Spirit to guide you. Where you think, hang on a minute, that, that doesn't sound like the Lord's voice. That's not, a good, that's not a good thing. That doesn't sound right. And you start to recognize the enemy's voice. And you can avert doing something that you'll regret later and cause damage later. And that's why earlier James says, you know, uh, someone who's never at fault in everything they say is, is, uh, is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When you keep something in check, it means you keep something on a short leash. You keep it close to you. It's not like you take the dog to the park and then just let it run riot. You don't know where it's going to go. You hope it will come back to you. Many owners do that. They've got confidence in the dog. And, but it's the equivalent of what James is saying here is you keep, if you're, you've got a dog, you're keeping it on a short leash because you're aware that it can cause damage. And James is saying, treat the tongue as if it's one of those things that can cause damage. Don't trust yourself too much because however you think, it's got the potential. So just be vigilant. Keep it on a short leash. And it says here that... Uh, uh, well, let me share, I'm going to share a personal testimony with you now. Um, I went into work one day. This was maybe 30 years ago. It was a high street branch. And... Uh, I, I was the manager of the branch and one of my staff came in and her face was white, Diane. Uh, I said, Diane, are you, uh, are you okay this morning? Are you everything okay? And she used to me, yeah, Chris, she used to me, I, I heard something on the news this morning, it really shook me. I, I just thought of you and your family. I said, what, what, what was it? And she said, I just heard on the news that there'd been an incident in Southgate um, London, and that's where your family are from, is that right? I said, yes, that's where my family, my parents still live there, one of my brothers lives not far. He says, and um, and your brother is Jimmy, isn't it? I said, yes, Jimmy's one of my brothers, he lives nearby. He said, there was an incident that happened outside the underground station, it was busy traffic, she said. And she said, it was at a standstill, and uh, nobody was moving, and um, basically, um, she said that it was reported that there was an altercation and somebody called Jimmy Demetrio was, was killed. And, and she I just, I just thought of your brother. I, I, is he okay? Do you, have you heard anything? And I knew I'd spoken to Jimmy. I said, when did this happen? So it wasn't my brother, but that was his name. But because of what she'd said, I went home and looked up the story. And we had two cars, one behind the other. Somebody beats him from behind. One's got his family in the car. The other one's got his girlfriend. So one's got children and a wife. The other one's got his girlfriend. Beeps him. What's going on? The, the chap in front can't move because the traffic's not moving. So he gets a bit upset. It's a bit hot and uncomfortable. He, he does a sign, let's say. I can't remember the details, but it does a sign in the, in, the, in the rearview mirror. The other person gets out. Now, these are decisions that we have to make at every stage. You have to decide. He's beat. What do I do? You have to decide. Am I going to put wood on this or not? It's up, it's up to you, isn't it? It's up to me. So he does the V sign or whatever, two fingers. And then the other person thinks, I'm going to get out of the car. I'm not having this. So he has to make a decision. He gets out of the car, slams the door, walks over, winds the window down. They exchange words. They exchange words through the window. The other one gets out. And before we know it, they are in a fight before one of them goes and takes a, a weapon out of the boot. Unfortunately, it was a fatal altercation and a family lost their husband and, and father. But, you know, what started off as a beep 
can end up with just devastation. It, it, it can be devastating. And we may not have those incidents in our lives like that, but we know in families, or not just in families, words can be devastating, even as they can be healing too. Can I just say this morning, this is not the end of the subject on, on the power of the tongue. I'll be preaching again next week, and we'll follow on with examples and practical examples. But there's some of that today. And then... James goes on to say, he says, he says, all kinds of animals. He says, we've got birds, reptiles, sea creatures. They're being tamed. and they, They've been tamed. They are being tamed by, by mankind, he says. But no human being can tame the tongue. It's a difficult thing, very difficult thing to tame without the help of the Lord and the Holy Spirit. We do have to make choices and choose. And that's when he goes on to say, it's a restless evil, full of deadly poison. You know, throughout scripture, there's an order to things. We have thoughts over here. Now, thoughts might not go anywhere. We have a choice. The Bible says, take every thought captive to Christ. But if we don't do that, thoughts become actions. Sorry, they become words. We don't normally go from... Uh, thoughts to action. Sometimes we do, but most often we go from thoughts to words and then actions. And the point that we can catch things is at the thought stage. Mm -hmm. <sighs> That's things that that person just said. I'm not having that. Well, why can't you have it? Well, I'm going to say, do you have to say it now? Well, I'd rather say it now. I feel like it. Yeah. But can you trust yourself to speak? Not the short leash. Do I trust myself to say it right now? Can it wait until this afternoon? Can it wait after the, the party? Can it wait after the meeting? Are you better off going home and think ring tomorrow? Would it be better you writing things down first? But we go from... This is, this is a principle of life and the scripture. We go from thoughts to words. But once the words are out, they're difficult to come back. God is gracious, of course. And this healing in God's name, by his grace. Healing of relationships, healing of words. There's forgiveness, of course. But you know, we can't take them back. Mm -hmm. And it's when the words become actions and we have devastation. And then we have James talking about, uh, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and then we curse other people, he says, that are made in God's image. He says, how does it work? H how can we... It's not consistent, James is saying. And that's what he says. He says, can both fresh water and salt water flow out of the same spring? Is that, it's impossible, he says. It doesn't happen. And he says, can a fig tree bear olives? Well, it's, the source is a fig tree, so you're not expecting olives. And so if we're going to say something that's got a source and it's not a godly source, we, we, we shouldn't expect good things to come of it. But if we're sharing something that's got a godly source, even if someone takes it the wrong way, ultimately it will still come out good because it came from the right source. As long as you did your bit right. And I'm not talking about the kind of, I call it a spade a spade. I'm talking about you, generally, you genuinely sought God to express what you needed to say. And it was right. And if somebody's upset, then so be it. But James is saying, check your source. Where it's coming from. You know, I think we've all known families that have, uh, maybe our own, I know I can, I can certainly speak for this, where there's been rifts for years. Not just a few weeks and a sulk, not just a few days. It's just gone on for years. Um, it, 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 it sapped, it, it sapped perhaps the joy of life for a while until you find some other way of doing it and dealing with it. And we'll come on to more of the practical applications next week. But the Bible says that anyone who's a believer. And an adopted son and daughter of the Most High God 
is an ambassador of Christ. We represent his kingdom. We are called upon to draw upon him as source. And the Bible also says we have the message of reconciliation. Reconciliation means to make peace. And when Paul writes to the Corinthian church, he's talking about reconciliation between human beings and God. Because if you live without God, you're an enemy of God. You might say, well, I don't feel like an enemy of God. But you are an enemy of God if you're not living in relationship with God. Not acknowledging him and giving him his place in this world, in this life. So we do have a message of reconciliation, giving people the message of God's love. His desire to have a relationship with you and me. So that is the message of reconciliation, to make peace, make our peace with God. We often talk about somebody being on their deathbed. And we hear later that they made their peace with God. They may not have lived life right, lived life for him. But they made their peace with God before they passed away. But that message of reconciliation is not just this way. It's not just top down. It's this way as well. We're called to live at peace, to sow peace. The Bible says that we will reap a harvest of righteousness if we do. And key to that is the tongue, our words. And we can trust God to use our words for his glory if we are connected to his source and to speak life and not death and to be known for that. To actually be known that, you know, when I speak to Margaret, it gives me life. You know, when, when I ever have a chat with Stella, she, you know, I, I just feel encouraged. I feel for life. And even if I've made mistakes, I, I didn't feel condemned. I felt like there was a way forward. There was a suggestion. There was advice. There was... It feels different to speak to somebody whose words are life rather than to speak to somebody who just turns around and said, told you so, you're stuck. End of. You know that kind. Of, you know, you know the, you know the spirit with which somebody speaks. Anyway, let's finish there and pray. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, before I actually pray out loud. I'm just gonna give perhaps 30 seconds for just to reflect on words spoken over you, words that you've spoken, things that have hurt, things might be still hurting, things that you've got over over. You know, you've got over it maybe 60%, but there's still some. Some residual stuff. You know what it's like. You just need the Lord to come in and bring healing with his word and what he says about us. The Bible says anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Those are words. We call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. And it means that if we are, if we come and confess our sins or wrongdoing, the Lord is faithful to forgive. And he gives us his Holy Spirit so we can live life in him. And if anyone here this morning has not got a relationship with God, the Bible says that it's only through Jesus Christ that you can have that relationship. And it's a relationship that brings healing because we can't do these things on our own, the Bible says. We're not. We're not able to be good enough. No one is perfect in that respect. We need the Lord. And the Lord is calling out this morning and saying, look, come to me and I'll bring healing for past hurts. I'll give you my words to replace your words. His words are always going to be better than our words. Father, Lord, as I pray, as I leave this silence, Lord, I pray that you'll speak to each of us. Lord, may you bring by your Holy Spirit before our minds Things that have happened, words spoken. Things that we might need still healing for. People that have, people that we've, we've said things to, where we've used our words in the wrong way. Where we maybe need to forgive ourselves because it's over and done. Maybe we've actually apologised, but we haven't forgiven ourselves. Father, help us to receive your forgiveness and know that we're forgiven. So we don't carry any unresolved issues forward, Lord, from today. That we leave them here at the foot of the cross in your presence, Lord, we pray.
I'm just going to leave a silence before we finish.